everyone. I'm Lisa Andrevilla, and I'm joined today by activist and co-founder of Black Lives Matter, Opal Tometi. Opal, thank you so much for joining us today. I've really been looking forward to our conversation, but I'm sad to have to start it with the bad news that Jacob Blake, a black man, was shot this weekend. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what the reaction has been since then, especially after a summer that has been so full of protests and additional scrutiny at, at the way that black people are treated at the hands of police. You know, it's been very hard to witness time and time again that Black people in this country are treated with such disdain and disrespect and our lives are ultimately, you know, so devalued that we can see a man be shot in front of his children and almost killed. At this point, we're just thanking God that Jacob has survived. Um, we're looking and, and, and wondering, you know, what his quality of life will actually be. Um, but it seems like right now that he might be paralyzed and his children and the entire community of Kenosha and really the, 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 the world and everybody who witnessed what took place are traumatized. You know, we're, we're living with you know, a, a, a level of, of PTSD every single time we see and hear these stories of unarmed Black people, people who are actually trying to do right by their families, by their communities, people who are trying to just live their lives, um, but having their lives be under threat from law enforcement, um, from vigilantes, and even sometimes from other security personnel. And what we're witnessing right now is also an uprising against the injustice that we saw take place um, in Wisconsin. These are issues that I know that you have worked on for years. So I did want to talk a little bit about how you think the movement has changed between the time that it kicked off in the early 2010s and now in the wake of really George Floyd's death earlier this summer. Yep. The movement is really one that has been longstanding and has been going on. And myself um, and the co-founders of Black Lives Matter, as well as people who have been involved in this incredible human rights movement, really find ourselves as part of a tradition of, of fighting for human rights and social justice in this country. You know, ever since Black people were kidnapped from Africa, brought to this land that was stolen and there was indigenous genocide, we have always you know, been resisting. We've always been fighting for a world where our lives were treated with the respect um, and the dignity that we we've, we've deserve um, and that we're owed. And what we're seeing now and what you know, even began in, in, in 2013 when we co-founded Black Lives Matter was that Black people were ultimately being killed uh, by the police and by vigilantes and there was impunity and there is and continues to be impunity. We don't see any modicum of justice uh, being served and being afforded to black people. And in this country that was built by black people, we are just tired. We're ultimately fed up and people are essentially saying enough is enough. And in 2013, when we co-founded Black Lives Matter, I'll tell you, it was a very personal project for me. Um, I had actually just watched the film called Fruitvale Station, which is a story of Oscar Grant, a young brother who was killed on New Year's Day by Oakland Police Department. And I had just watched that film and walked out of the movie theater and got the news that George Zimmerman was acquitted for the murder of Trayvon Martin. And if folks remember, Trayvon Martin was a 17-year-old boy who was in his own neighborhood with um, nothing, armed with nothing but a bag of Skittles and an Arizona iced tea. And he was going home. He should have been home and, and with his family. He should have been able to make it there. He should be able to celebrate his birthday and holidays with his loved ones. But his life was cut short because of racist anti-Black violence that was perpetrated by the vigilante George Zimmerman. And 
watching that case unfold and George, George Zimmerman being acquitted for that murder, a murder we all know he, he did and should not have done um, after he was also told by um, officials on the phone not to follow Trayvon, he was acquitted. And it broke my heart because I have two younger brothers um, and lots of young people in my life that I knew were going to be affected by this story and were going to feel that their lives didn't matter. And even for myself and for many of my sisters and friends and, and loved ones, it felt very personal to me. And I wanted to be sure that folks knew that another way was possible that we could rise up, that we could join hands, and that we could advocate for justice for our communities. And that was, you know, in essence, the, the spirit of which I joined um, alongside Alicia Garza and Patrice Cullors in creating Black Lives Matter. We wanted people to be reminded of the tradition of community organizing that so many of our, of our elders were part of. So when I look at a Martin Luther King or John Lewis or an Ella Baker, you know, even a Malcolm X, people who were deeply and, and connected with their communities and who empowered their communities to stand up for their rights and to assert their human dignity and to just love on each other and make sure that we're looking out for each other and compelling um, our allies, compelling the world to pay attention and to support us and to ensure that our human rights uh, were no longer violated, to ensure that people stopped killing, you know, black people. Um, and that is in essence kind of the, the, the beginnings of Black Lives Matter. And, you know, I would also just add that what we've also been witnessing didn't just happen, you know, in 2013. The reality is that this has been going on for decades. Black people have been killed at the hands of the police. Black people not only are being killed at the hands of police, but we're suffering in our healthcare system, in our education system, we're seeing um, substandard housing and, and beyond. And so the quality of life that we're also experiencing in this country is abysmal. And so the invitation for Black Lives Matter was, let's also think about um, racism in a structural way that understands that we're not just talking about, you know, the criminal justice system or the system of policing, but we're talking about the way our society operates overall. We're talking about the power structure overall and how the power structure is such that Black lives are disempowered and Black people are being treated as if our lives don't matter. And so the invitation for BLM has always been one that's actually about transforming the entirety of our society to ensure that Black lives are respected um, and treated with the same level of, of equity that everybody has afforded um, in this country that doesn't look <laughs> you know, like me. Um, black people are treated as though our skin is a weapon or our skin is a crime and we're fed up because it's it's not black is beautiful, black is you know incredible, and we need to see the same types of of respect that others are afforded in this country um, afforded to black people as well. You just hearken back to some of the civil rights leaders, um, and there's a very poignant connection this week actually on the anniversary of the March on Washington's the 57th anniversary of the March on Washington um, and here here in DC where I am we're expecting thousands of activists and protesters to come out uh, to call for police reform I want to talk to you a little bit about what's next and what are the legislative fixes that still need to happen in order to address these issues of police brutality yeah so I'm really heartened that people are coming together uh, this weekend under this, uh, under this banner and this um, call to remind ourselves that we're part of an incredible legacy of people who have fought uh, hard and tirelessly for justice and for human rights in this country. Um, coming into this weekend, we're gonna be seeing people celebrating um, as well as affirming the need for justice right now. And so this March on Washington is happening and people are gonna be calling for the defunding of police and the reallocating of resources uh, to supporting black communities, to 
being invested in life, <laughs> in, in justice. And what that really looks like is investing in the education system, you know, investing in jobs, you know, investing in healthcare system that works. I think one of the things that we witnessed and we continue to witness throughout this pandemic is that doctors, nurses, other healthcare professionals, janitors, you know, beyond people who really care for us, these essential workers and their essential lives were under threat because they were not funded well. They did not have the resources to support um, people, to keep us healthy, to keep us ultimately safe. And what we're calling for is a reimagining of safety for our people, a reimagining of safety for this entire country and for the world. And in that reimagination, it means we need resources to, to make that work. And so what we're calling for is, hey, we see what's happening right now. We see a militarized police force that is descending on communities and protesters around the country. And why is this police force so overly funded? Why are their budgets so bloated when these hospitals and these essential workers can't get the same type of support that they deserve? And so what we're calling for right now is let's re-examine uh, what safety looks like and let's also re-examine our budgets so that they match our real values. If we believe that all lives should matter, then we need to actually resource and ensure that we have the support and the necessary ingredients to ensure that that happens. And right now it's clear as day that that is not the case. And so what we've been calling for is um, really looking at safety beyond policing, looking at safety from a holistic perspective and looking at safety from a place of dignity and real respect for everybody. We need to have a multiracial democracy that works for everybody. And in order for that to happen, we have to look at these systems that have been completely failing us and not only are they failing us, they weren't really designed to succeed for Black lives. And we just have to be honest about that. And this is the time for, for that radical um, honesty that we deserve. Um, because at this point, we can see it on camera, you know, day in and day out, even in the pandemic, Black people are being shot and killed by police. And we are are just tired and fed up and we can no longer tolerate this type of war on black life. Opal, you've started touching on this idea that the Black Lives Matter movement is more than just about the issue of policing, however central that may be to, to what, you, what you fight against. And I do want to talk about how that translates into voting rights in a year that there's so much talk and uncertainty around the administration of elections. What are you doing to encourage your supporters to do to ensure that their voice is heard at the ballots? I think to be clear, everyone must know that this year is incredibly important for the vote. Um, not only are we seeing the United States transforming in various ways in, that are negative, um, and that are infringing both on our rights, but also our ability to thrive and, and even just basically pr protect our families and our communities. We're seeing laws change overnight. We're seeing um, judges being appointed. We're seeing uh, ways in which the right wing and, and nativist organizations have been infiltrating um, local jurisdictions from you know, local uh, elected officials who are standing right alongside uh, white nationalists to um, the ways in which law enforcement has also been infiltrated by white supremacist groups. We're seeing this play out and impact every facet of our lives. And the reality is we're also seeing the laws change to suppress voters, um, suppress the turnout of voters. Um, we know that there are organizations who have been 
fighting to ensure that the Voting Rights Act um, is strengthened and protected. But I will just say that it is, it is sad to see that this is even a conversation in this day and age, given the tremendous work of leaders like John Lewis, who recently passed um, and quite literally almost gave his life to ensure these rights and these, that we weren't disenfranchised for the right to vote. Um, what we're seeing now is that there are active forces to stop the vote from uh, changing the polling stations to shutting some down to gerrymandering to attacks on the postal service. We know that the vote is under threat and that means our democracy is under threat. This country is under threat from even within. And what we're doing right now is encouraging people to protect their vote, to register, um, to ensure that they go out, to mail in their ballots early where um, eligible and when they're, where they're able. Um, and we're encouraging people who might not even be eligible to vote. So for example, you know, I work with a lot of immigrants and you know, we have undocumented people in all of our communities, you know, brown, black, beyond. And it's important that they too encourage people in their lives that do have the ability to vote uh, to do that. And so we're gonna make voting um, fun, <laughs> you know, as much as we can. We're going to ensure that people are able to stand in those lines if they need to. And we, you know, quite honestly, don't want that to be the case. But being that there are some places that are uh, really pushing back on mail-in voting, we're going to have to get really creative. And I hope that there will be many other elected officials and other community leaders that will stand alongside us and alongside you know, various artists, activists, advocates, and beyond who are calling for um, just real engagement around this election. We know that it's a very uh, contentious one. We know that there's a lot at stake and we can't afford to have this election be one that people sit out. Uh, it's sad that the United States is in a place where there are many people who have felt so, um, you know, ultimately a lot of people have felt that these, their voices and their votes don't matter. And so what we need to do is begin to reinstall, uh, reinvigorate a sense of, of faith and hope in people and their votes and know that no matter who's in the both federal positions, but also local and state, that we hold them accountable, that we continue to push them to do what is right and what is just. And that ultimately is what we're going to continue to see um, no matter what these outcomes are over the next uh, few months. We're going to continue to, to push, to fight, to ensure justice. And it's what we've been doing, but we'll have to uh, ensure that we continue to do that going forward. I did want to ask, this is another issue that disproportionately affects people of color, which is that they make up a large chunk, a disproportionately large chunk of people who are incarcerated. However, there's a, there's a huge segment of that population that is eligible to vote. Is there anything that Black Lives Matter is doing to get out the vote among these jailed but eligible voters? You know what, there are some organizations that are working on this issue right now. Uh, and I'm excited to see that there are people who are really taking seriously the fact that we do have many eligible voters who aren't being encouraged or who haven't historically been as encouraged to vote and been systematically disenfranchised or discouraged from voting uh, to get out the vote. And we're also encouraging our allies to do the same in their communities. We know that there are also a lot of white folks, um, other communities who haven't been as, as engaged as well. And so we're encouraging them to do the same in their communities, to encourage people of conscience to step up, be courageous and exercise their voice and exercise their vote. It's imperative right now that everybody of conscience be out there, um, not only to vote, but encourage others to do the same. What about voter intimidation? Do you worry that there might be a rise in that ahead of the November election? 
There is already a great deal of voter intimidation. We've seen that people who've even accidentally uh, voted have been arrested, have been charged, have been locked up. And this largely only impacts uh, black people. <laughs> you know, black, for example, there was a, a black mom who didn't know that she was ineligible to vote um, after having a, a very, like a felony years prior and accidentally voted, which in this day and age should not be a crime that is punishable in this way, but it is. And what we see is that people are using even these stories as uh, rare as they might be of, of, of um, uh, accusations of voter fraud, which just doesn't happen. The, the amount of voter fraud in this country is is so negligible and, and ultimately non-existent. People aren't intentionally going out to, to vote. And the, the real fraud and the real concern here, I think, is that so many people are being taken off of the rolls. People are being told that they voted at the wrong polling station or that they no longer um, are able to vote by mail and they weren't able to vote in the primaries and they did it wrong. And so those to me are the types of um, behaviors that not only intimidate people, but they discourage people from engaging in this process. And I think this country has a responsibility, a moral duty, an ethical duty to encourage and, uh, and, and make accessible the ability for everybody <laughs> who is 18 and above uh, to, to vote. And it's sad that we are in a country that makes it so difficult when there are examples of others who make it quite easy, even, you know, over, you know, the, the internet. Some make you automatically, um, and you're already enrolled, you don't have to take extra steps, but you hit a certain age and you're eligible to vote and you don't have to register. So there are ways that this country should be modern and should modernize our systems of, of voting. And I can't wait for the day for us to finally uh, take our uh, mandate seriously and implement all of the strategies to make voting as easy and seamless as possible for everybody who is eligible. We've had a really wide ranging conversation, but I do want to end on a note of positivity. So I do want to ask, what what is it with everything going on right now that gives you hope for the future? Oh, I love that question. <laughs> What gives me hope for the future is that we are seeing this movement grow. Uh, the New York Times reported some time ago that we are the largest movement in history. And that to me is incredibly heartening because I know that this is actually a multiracial movement and it's a multi-issue movement as well. And I am heartened to see that there are so many people of conscience and of courage who have stepped up and who want to be on the right side of history. And that makes me incredibly happy, incredibly proud of everyone who is using their voice and standing up and speaking out. And I'm also really encouraged when I see young people. <laughs> I see a lot of my friends' children and just, you know, even allies or just different supporters who are showing me these videos of their kids chanting Black Lives Matter. And these kids are white and Chinese and they're um, from all different backgrounds. And they are getting this message that we must affirm dignity and life of Black lives. And that to me is very hopeful. And it reminds me that we can achieve what we've set out to, to do. And that there are a lot more people who are on our side, who are on the side of history, who are on the side of human rights and justice for all of us. Opal, thank you so much for joining us today for this fascinating conversation. We really appreciate your time and insights. Thanks so much for having me.